in um, about six. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Laura Ayras. Please, Laura. Laura is the professor of neuroimmunology. And now we hear something clinical, I guess, about um, multiple sclerosis, please. Okay, good afternoon, all. So my name is Laura Ayras. I'm a neurologist and um, professor of neuroimmunology. So we will switch gears now completely from this uh, deep immunophenotyping. We will go to uh, more clinical medicine. So being a neurologist uh, and neuroimmunologist, um, I mostly take care of and uh, uh, research uh, neuroimmunological diseases, mainly multiple sclerosis. Okay, okay, it's a bit slow. Okay, here are my disclosures. And um, so you probably um, know something about MS, but let's just uh, briefly go through. So it's, uh, it's the most common neurologic disease of young adults. So there are about two and a half million MS patients in the world. Um, the patients get the diagnosis at quite a uh, young age of 30 years old, and uh, MS uh, normally starts as a relapsing remitting disease. disease. So uh, patients experience these uh, episodic attacks of neurologic symptoms uh, in 85% of the cases initially, but about 15% have this chronic uh, progressive disease from onset with just uh, uh, accumulating neurological disability and no clear relapses here. But after about 15 years, the relapsing remitting MS uh, converts into this secondary progressive MS, at least in um, about 65 to 70% of, of the cases. We still don't know what causes MS, but uh, there's a complex interaction between uh, the, a genetic predisposition and uh, an environmental trigger that probably will then initiate this autoimmune inflammatory disease. So the greatest unmet need in the field of neuroimmunology is lack of treatment uh, for progressive MS. And I will explain why. So in the relapsing remitting form of MS, um, the pathology is really driven by the adaptive immune system. So, so the lymphocytes enter the CNS from the periphery and they form these uh, inflammatory infiltrates, which are typically around blood vessels, uh, as shown here. Uh, in MRI, uh, they are shown as these white dots, like stars in the sky. And uh, here, where the blood-brain barrier is broken, um, you can see this gadolinium enhancement. So it, it means that this, uh, this lesion is new, newly formed. Um, and this uh, inflammation is very harmful to brain cells. So um, uh, it sort of eats away the underlying healthy brain tissue like a midsummer bonfire. Um, at the moment, we have about 15 drugs to treat relapsing remitting MS. We have some very, very efficient drugs. And <clears throat> all of these drugs uh, target the peripheral immune system. And it's quite, this is easy to achieve. Uh, to, to, in, in, uh, to calm down the peripheral immune system. Uh, but when the disease uh, changes um, into this progressive, secondary progressive stage, also the pathology changes. So there's much less of this trafficking of the lymphocytes from the periphery into the central nervous system, but the inflammation sort of becomes trapped within the central nervous system. There's this um, smoldering inflammation, which also spreads outside the focal inflammatory lesions. And what we see is a lot of microglial activation, and this uh, uh, causes oxidative stress um, in, the, in the central nervous system. There's mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, and all of this leads then uh, with time to axonal damage, uh, to atrophy and uh, disability. And at the moment, we have no drug to target this smoldering inflammation in the central nervous system. So what we see in the clinic, um, so this is actually quite sad 
because uh, the patient might have been diligently taking the drug for 15 years. And all the relapses are well kept under control. Maybe the MRI can be totally stable. But then after 15 years, they will start experiencing these uh, symptoms. And typically, um, their walking goes bad, their balance goes bad, they have bladder problems, they have cognitive problems, they have fatigue. And no drug that we have impacts this process of the disease in any way. And, and we, we can only sort of raise our hands and say, sorry, we don't have anything to, to give to you at this stage. Of course, we have symptomatic treatments that we can give that will alleviate the symptoms, but it doesn't uh, impact the disease process. And this is also said what the neuropathologist says, uh, uh, sees on the table. So the MS brain uh, often is really significantly shrunk. There's great atrophy. And of course, this goes along with uh, also cognitive um, um, problems. So this we would like to prevent. Um, so now let's say a few uh, words about the microglia. So healthy brain needs uh, microglia. So they are there to keep things clean. So they, they uh, eat up the debris and, and of course fight uh, also external intruders like, like microbes and so on. Uh, but in a context of chronic neuroinflammation, these microglial cells acquire this persisting um, pro-inflammatory state, uh, which leads to this uncontrolled inflammation and leads to uh, progressive neurodegeneration. And if we look at the evolution of an MS lesion, so in the beginning, the lesion is full of macrophages, but with time, the macrophages and microglial cells, they uh, shift to the edge of the lesion. And then in some lesions with time, uh, this inflammation vanishes completely. And then we only have these chronic silent lesions, which have no uh, associated inflammation. Now uh, we know that it's these chronic active lesions, which are really bad news for the patients, because these are very strongly associated uh, with the progression of the, of the disease. If we're looking at the conventional MRI imaging, uh, you can see here in this MR T1 weighted MRI. So in T1 weighted MRI, uh, water is black. So, so we have these black, we call these black holes also, but they all look identical to each other. So, so these are sites where there has been inflama acute inflammation, the acute inflammation has subsided, and what, what it uh, leaves is this uh, black hole in in the MRI. So the black holes all look identical to each other, but we know that they are not identical. So some of these will have the microglial uh, rim and some don't. So we need better techniques than the T1 MRI uh, to detect these um, uh, chronic active lesions. And for this, we can use PET imaging. So the microglia, when they get activated, they upregulate this uh, TSPO molecule. And we have radioligands that bind to the TSPO molecule. And then we can measure how much uh, TSPO there is uh, expressed and in association also with the lesions. And uh, these are not showing very well, uh, but they are uh, some of the PET images. Uh, so here's an MRI image which shows two uh, identical looking T1 black holes, but with PET, you can see that the top one um, is taking up the, the radial ligand and the bottom one isn't. So the top one is a chronic active lesion and uh, the bottom one is a chronic inactive lesion. And we can quantitate this then um, in, in the whole brain. Um, also, in addition, what we can do, we can uh, measure sort of, sort of the more diffuse microglial activation in the normal brain white matter, for example. So this is all areas outside lesions. These are areas that look no perfectly normal in MRI or in the thalamus. Uh, and we can uh, show that uh, in SPMS, so in more advanced uh, MS, with, uh, pa where patients have progression, they have a uh, much higher microglial activation in these areas compared to relapsing remitting MS patients or healthy controls. So we have also shown 
that having this increased pet measurable microglial activation is bad news in terms of later disease progression because those patients who had this increased microglial activation then showed uh, signs of clinical progression during the four um, uh, subsequent years of follow-up. So this really tells us that microglial activation is bad news. So why hasn't been, has it been so uh, difficult to uh, develop new drugs for progressive MS? So there has been this incomplete understanding of the pathogenesis of this part of the disease. Uh, secondly, the inflammation is contained within the central nervous system and the drugs really need to go there and to target the pathology there in the central nervous system. As you know, many of our drugs don't go into the, into the CNS and they will not be effective here. Uh, we don't have so good um, outcome measures um, or predictive biomarkers um, for progressive MS, or we haven't had. Um, whereas in relapsing remitting MS, the focal lesions in uh, MRI is a very sensitive and good biomarker. And this is what all our drug studies are based on. How well does the drug prevent emergence of new focal lesions? But this doesn't work for progressive MS. Also, the progression is quite slow. So the studies need to be very long, three-year studies minimum at the moment. Uh, and, and they are large studies, so like 1,000 patients. So it means that they are so expensive that nobody else but big pharma can do these studies. So, so, th so this has been really um, a th um, something that has slowed down the, the drug development and made it so difficult. So we have about 50 trials over 30 years, nearly all have failed. Um, all have been negative except two trials. So Novartis did a siponimod trial in SPMS. So siponimod is a sphingosine receptor modulator uh, and sphingosine receptor modulators are used in RRMS. Uh, and in this uh, study, they showed that um, 32% of patients on placebo progressed over the three years, whereas only 26% uh, on siponimod progressed. And statistically, this, uh, they, they got a p-value that was uh, statistically significant. But of course, I mean, you can vision yourselves how, how really useful this is in the clinic. Mm. But anyway, because of the statistical significance, um, this was approved by FDA and EMA both, and uh, it, it's now available for this indication. Uh, same with ocrelizumab, uh, anti B cell drug, very, very effective in RRMS, like the best. Um, a study in PPMS, 39% uh, thir uh, of patients on placebo progressed, 33% of patients on ocrelizumab progressed, also approved and used. So, so this is where we are. It's sad, but but since this is like the the really the, the such a big unmet need. So now, really, there's great efforts in in trying to develop treatments for progressive MS, and this is like where the field has really shifted now. And um, and and this is one um, approach that that we are also trying. So, so um, the homeostatic microglia, that's the, that's, these are the good guys in the brain. Um, in chronic inflammation, they uh, change phenotype to this uh, pro-inflammatory microglia. So if we could therapeutically reverse this back, so, so this, after everything I've said, it makes sense to you too, I hope, <laughs> that this, uh, might be beneficial for the patients. Uh, of course, the, the immuno-oncologists are doing this the other way around. So they are wanting to uh, change the, the, the M2-type macrophages to M1-type macrophages. And uh, I think here's uh, some great potential for inflames collaboration and for industry collaboration to find these targets that we could um, use for changing the phenotype of this microglia. So I know I've been uh, hassling Marco 
uh, that don't even have any any compounds that would um, do the shift um, this way because you are not interested in that, but we are. And he said that yes, they have some, but he hasn't found the notebook yet where it's written. So I'm still waiting for that. And of course, if anybody else uh, uh, knows of any compounds that we could use to change the pro-inflammatory microglia to the homeostatic microglia, please come and tell me. So we'll do a study then together. Um, so this would be the um, phase two study. So we would give this compound to the patients who have a lot of these uh, smoldering or chronic active lesions. And, um, and then we'd measure using TSPO PET and see that these smoldering lesions uh, disappear. So the future treatment trials targeting neurodegeneration in MS. So I think we need to use add-on therapy. So we still need to block the inflammation coming from the periphery into the CNS. But in, on top of that, we need something that will directly affect the brain uh, pathology uh, ongoing there. Other ways are to boost remyelination to help the patients. Other way is uh, eliminating the CNS contained B cell follicles, uh, which are also thought to be a bad thing. And then uh, the microglia targeting drugs. Um, already, there are um, studies in other neurodegenerative diseases which are uh, aiming uh, to target microglia and which are using TSPO PET as a primary outcome or as a secondary outcome, like uh, at least a couple of studies in ALS, a uh, study in Alzheimer's disease and in Huntington's disease. So this is already ongoing. In MS, uh, there's no studies ongoing with new compounds targeting microglia, but, but uh, certainly there are uh, studies looking at, at some old drugs. So MS disease and treatment in numbers. I know there are some big uh, office, um, fans of uh, meta numbers like Timo Veroma here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is just uh, like uh, kitchen, <laughs> kitchen uh, mathematics. But uh, so about two and a half million patients worldwide, about one million in USA and 12,000 in Finland. 40% maybe of all of these have progressive disease. So in Turku, we have an MS register where we can check basically like a, a real um, life, how our patients are treated. So about 75 of our progressive patients are untreated. So maybe if this holds true in the, at the global level, so maybe there are about 70, 750,000 untreated progressive patients in the world. So this, uh, if you do the maths, if you think that in, in the US, um, uh, one year of treatment is 47,000 US dollars. So um, uh, globally, so there's about uh, 35 billion um, market for these uh, drugs for secondary progressive MS or progressive MS in general. So this is uh, our research group um, who we are, um, or who we work to try to um, figure out this progressive MS and how to treat it. So um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. <laughs> but it looks like I also used my time. Up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if there, there are some uh, <laughs> burning questions, uh, or you can, of course, ask them uh, during the... Uh, and send me is email, especially if you have this compound that would reverse the... <laughs> Corticosteroid, so, corticosteroids. Yeah, but it uh, doesn't work long term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I have one, one question, because this ocrelizumab is anti-CD20, the same as rituximab, targeting uh, B cells, kind of depleting them. So... It, when, when I was studying, uh, you know, neurology, they said that T cells, T cells are the bad, bad things, but looks like they are actually B cells, at least in yeah, large Yeah, part. this was a really big surprise that the studies were really so effective. And, um, and of course, there's been a lot of uh, then research going into this. But uh, so I think now the thinking is that uh, it's really the B cell help to T cells okay. that's crucial, then that then helps to, to stop the disease. 
Okay. Um, thank you, Laura. Yeah. Or oh, Maya. Yeah. Yes, so. Ah, no, I will repeat the question. So Maya is asking why why the macrophages, some macrophages, but, but, but um, Laura showed uh, uh, accumulating iron, whereas the other ones are not. Yes, so, um, so myelin contains a lot of iron. And when there's myelin damage, and the macrophages and microglia take up um, or eat up the myelin, so they then take the iron as well. And, and this um, this can be then seen. So so it's more like in the early stage uh, where they haven't yet eaten up the uh, iron. So so that's uh, when you don't see it. So actually, this is really interesting. This uh, iron thing because uh, now this can be uh, used also in MRI imaging. So so there are se MRI sequences that um, and post processing techniques that that can be used to visualize this these iron rims uh, also in living patients. So 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 it, of course it's much easier to do MRI uh, than PET. So so and it's. Iron one. regulates macrophage mm, Yeah yeah yeah. So so actually it has been shown quite nicely that at these rims, so there's uh, uh, it's really the pro-inflammatory uh, microglia and macrophages that have the iron. So Maya was just commenting that iron regulates uh, macrophage polarization, and then she was she was, <laughs> she was so quick <laughs> I, I, I couldn't stop her answering. 